Coming up, the pilot's account of flying through a tunnel and aviation fuel from sun and air. Honors for Garmin's Autoland and we fly the Piper M600. AOPA Live this week begins right after this. This is AOPA Live This Week with Alyssa Cobb and Warren Morningstar filling in for Tom Haynes. It's among the most prestigious awards in aviation with a 116 year history. It's given every year for the greatest achievements in aeronautics or astronautics in America. The winner is selected for improving the performance, efficiency, and safety of an air or space vehicle. It's the Collier Trophy, and names like Glenn Curtis, Orville Wright, Kelly Johnson, the Spaceship One team are all on it. And the latest name added, Garmin, for the Garmin Autoland system. Autoland is making travel by air safer and more accessible. It finally answers that question that nobody wants to talk about. What if? What if the pilot is unable to fly the airplane? What happens then? What happens to the passengers? Well, that question, that answer to that question is no longer uncertain. Now, this ceremony was a bit delayed. The award was actually announced in June, but last Thursday was the first time it seemed safe enough to get a large group together for a black tie Washington shindig. And for the folks from Olathe, Kansas, it was a big deal. It's incredible to be here tonight and being recognized for this. Um, we have a huge team here tonight, which is really exciting and really awesome that we can share this award with everyone. Um, it's interesting, though, because all of these things that we've worked on you know, to make Autoland are part of Garmin's core aviation technologies. And so there's a lot of people here that couldn't be here that weren't, they may not even think of themselves as being part of the team, but they, all of Garmin really helps to be part of this. It's just it's a great experience. Now the Collar Trophy itself is seven feet tall and weighs some 500 pounds. It usually lives in the Air and Space Museum. The Garmin folks get a smaller replica that they can ta take back to Olathe. Well, Garmin's Autoland is now available in three different aircraft, all under different names. Dyer calls it home safe in the TBM 940. Cirrus named it safe return in the Vision Jet. But the first aircraft to get Autoland certification was Piper's M600 turboprop and is part of what Piper calls the Halo Safety System. That's an integrated autonomous system that includes automatic level, auto throttle, and a hypoxia recognition system. AOP pilot editor-at-large Tom Horn recently put it all to the test. Well, here we are at the Vero Beach, Florida airport, leaving the Piper factory to give a demonstration of Piper's new top-of-the-line M600 SLS and its safety features, including what Piper calls its Halo Autoland feature. And it's ingenious. It's part of a package of safety features. After climbing to altitude, demo pilot Dan Lewis and I sample an overbank protection system that fights back if you overbank, reminding you to level the wings. Then there's a blue level button on the glare shield. If you get into an unusual attitude, push it and it will right the airplane. But the star of this cockpit is the Autoland system. Push the red guarded Autoland button and the airplane will begin a sequence of maneuvers that will take the plane to an airport and land automatically on its own. Back to Emergency auto land activated. Emergency Keep auto land out. system is controlling the aircraft and will land at the safest nearby airport. Please remain calm. Avoid touching the flight controls which may interfere with auto land. Your destination is shown on the bottom of the left and right displays. Your estimated time to landing is shown on the It begins by broadcasting a mayday over 121.5 squawks 7700 and picks an airport with a control tower, a wide runway with little crosswind, and an RNAV GPS LPV approach. On the way to the airport, it avoids terrain and weather 
using the terrain database and the airplane's Garmin weather radar and Sirius XM data link weather feeds. Meanwhile, we watched the system do its thing. Stow any loose articles prior to landing. You'll arrive at your destination shortly. Once the aircraft has landed and come to a complete stop, exit through the nearest door. We picked the Vero Beach Airport as our destination. We can do this because this airplane has a demonstration software load. This lets us bypass the automatic features that would normally run in a real emergency. But we want to suppress this in order to avoid an ATC disruption and shutting down the airport. The airplane descends to the final approach fix at the proper altitude and then maneuvers to nail the posted altitude and set up for the approach. The flaps and gear extend at the FAF and the auto throttle slows the airplane to 140, then 102 knots for short final. Inches before touchdown, power is reduced and auto trim brings up the nose for the flare. And there's touchdown. We're just a few inches right of the center line. Automatic braking follows, then the engine would shut down and the system would tell you to evacuate. It worked. How about that? There you have it. The award-winning Garmin Autoland system in action. Thanks for coming along on the ride. Tom Horn, AOPA Live. You know, Warren, I could see this feature becoming popular with aircraft owners who have, you know, non-flying spouses and family and friends who fly with them often uh, once it becomes available in smaller general aviation aircraft, kind of like how the, uh, the airframe power parachute has become more popular, especially for uh, those folks. Well, that's right, Alyssa. And, you know, I, I asked the Garmin folks when we might see this uh, technology coming to something like, say, uh, year 170, and this is what they told me. My goal right now is just to spread out of land, right, and get it to all the aircraft that fly if we can. So that's a big challenge. My grandfather's airplane is a Cessna 180. That's what I grew up flying. It's, a, it's an older airplane. It has, he's, he's gotten most of the STCs you can get on that airplane on it. And I think that's one of the goals that, that we have is I, I want to know how can I move Autoland into those retrofit markets and some of the existing fielded aircraft today. There's some obvious technical challenges, how we can, you know, ad, uh, adapt engine control, maybe braking. Smaller airplanes may not need as much braking as the bigger ones do. So there's some places there that we can really uh, have some flexibility, but it's going to take a lot, of, a lot of research and a lot of work to make sure these things are small and scalable so we can get them into those markets. But that's my goal. Any timeline on that? Nothing that I can share tonight. Uh, I would like to know that timeline too. 180 is just a small step uh, over to the 170, but you know what would be really interesting is to see how it handles uh, the tailwheels. Right, how it would yeah. make the rudder pedals dance, so to speak. Yeah, I think the tailwheel aircraft would be a, a really big challenge. But it it is interesting because although Bailey was pretty coy about when we see, may see it coming into the retrofit market, uh, the folks from uh, Cirrus were kind of coy too. It was sort of like saying, "Well, we, we've got some innovations coming pretty soon, so you know, stay tuned." It's already on its way, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's another bit of aviation technology that's critical to safety, the radar altimeter. It's crucial for helicopters, airliners, and many general aviation aircraft. But as we've told you before, the radar altimeter frequency band is under threat by the rollout of new 5G cell phone channels. Now, AOPA has joined a coalition of organizations across the aviation industries calling for a delay in that rollout. In a letter to the National Economic Council, the coalition asked for a joint industry working group to find a long-term solution to protect radar altimeters from 5G. That letter follows the FAA issuing a special airworthiness information bulletin asking manufacturers and operators to provide specific information to the FCC and other federal authorities about how the new 5G networks will com compromise radar altimeters. Well, the feds suddenly have a lot more money to spend on transportation safety improvements and other infrastructure. 
Congress has passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. President Biden will sign the law next week. That pumps some 1.2 trillion, that's trillion bucks, into fixing roads, improving the electric grid, expanding broadband, and much more. And for aviation, that means an additional 500 million for general aviation airports. The FAA will get 5 billion to improve air traffic control facilities, including control towers. And there's some 20 billion dollars for commercial service airports and terminals. And speaking of aviation, how about this? Fuel from nothing. Well, not exactly nothing, just sunlight and air. Swiss researchers say they have developed a process that they say can make synthetic kerosene using a sunlight-powered mini refinery. Now, the research was just published in Nature. The unit grabs carbon dioxide and water from the surrounding air and then converts it into syngas. A final step converts syngas into liquid hydrocarbons. Now, the test unit only produces some two ounces of fuel a day, but the Swiss scientists think the reactor can be improved and uh, scaled up for commercial fuel production in deserts where there's definitely a lot of sunshine. Meanwhile, Embraer this week announced a family of concept aircraft it's exploring toward the goal of reducing carbon emissions. In a live stream from Brazil, the company introduced the Energia family of aircraft. There are four different designs incorporating different propulsion technologies, electric, hydrogen fuel cell, dual fuel gas turbine, and hybrid electric. The nine-seat Energia hybrid could have 90% fewer carbon emissions than a conventional aircraft. The regional jet size Energia H2 gas turbine would run on hydrogen or sustainable aviation fuel. It could be almost free of carbon emissions. Embraer is evaluating each design for technical and commercial viability. Well, we don't know if this will be commercially viable, but it sure looks like it could be fun. Japan's Ministry of T Transport has just accepted type certification application for the SkyDrive flying car. Well, they're calling it a flying car, but it doesn't seem to have any wheels. The company claims they're the first such vehicle to get this far in Japan. They claim a flying speed of about 35 miles per hour and a range of about 15 miles. Eh, I don't think I'll replace my Toyota anytime soon. <laughs> I guess not. Well, you may remember the incredible Red Bull video released in September of an airplane flying through a tunnel. It may seem like a stunt to get views, but it was no reckless endeavor. Pilot Dario Costa spent over a year training and preparing for the 45-second flight. AOPA's Richard McSpadden and Kayla McLeod talked to Dario about the flight on an episode of Pilot Lounge. How did you get the idea to fly through a tunnel to push your personal boundary? I mean, it's... It's really not about personal boundaries. It's, it's, it's about, there is a lot of science in this project that I wanted to, to, to explore, you know? So it was, was more about what, what I've been going through the mind of, of most of the pilots around the world. Because I can't believe that nobody of you have ever thought what could happen if a plane flies through a tunnel. So I'm sure that someone has been thinking that, like me. So I'm not. I don't think I'm the first, and and I, I maybe maybe we're the last one now because it's been done. <laughs> but but was more to explore what was again was to to use science, which I'm I really love the science of flying. I think is fascinating, and I think that there is so much still to explore and to understand. And I always tell myself that that the day I will not get out of a plane after a flight and without learning anything from that flight, which can be any kind of flight, then that's the moment I have to stop flying because I'm overestimating myself. So my ego is too big, you know? So every minute of flight can teach us something. So it's about learning. It's not about setting boundaries or limits or minimum, you know? You know watch, I mean, after flying through a tunnel, then anything should be looking very easy to me and it's not everything everything has its specific challenges and and different so we we have to to be uh, very grounded and understand that when we are flying we are in an environment that we are not made for so mm -hmm. it's important to learn every time we fly that helps explain uh dario why your colleagues say about you in different 
uh, podcasts and periodicals, they say about you that you're very safety focused, which some people watching this would have not thought that, but it really is actually the key to doing the kind of adventurous flying you do safely is that whole scientific mindset you take to it. I really think safety is paramount and, uh, and I'm really scared of flying. So if you ask me, are you scared of flying? I am. If you ask me, are you scared of flying through a tunnel? Oh my God, I am. I mean, I was really, really scared, but that's what helps me to mitigate and to train and to get better and better and better. And that's why I love the science behind the flight because we can learn so much and we can improve safety so much. You can find that full episode on our YouTube channel. And I have to say, Alyssa, he said other people may have thought of flying through a tunnel. No, I've never thought of flying through a tunnel. <laughs> I have not either. <laughs> well, up next, it's a good time to be a young pilot. And honoring our veterans. Are you thinking about selling your airplane? I'm Kevin Tracy, and I own one of the largest advertising agencies north of Boston. And I'm the former VP of marketing at Piper. I know airplanes, and I know advertising. Go to TwinAirAviation.com to learn more about how I can help you sell your airplane. Welcome back. Future pilots or future professional pilots might be well advised to seek their future in corporate aviation. The demand is high right now. More than one third of professional pilots are pursuing careers in corporate aviation instead of the airlines. That according to Future and Active Pilot Advisors founder Lois Smith. And flight schools are filling up. ATP Flight School recently opened a large facility in Arlington, Texas to respond to the professional pilot shortage. You can read a lot more about this on our website. Safe to say, it's a pretty good time for young people to pursue professional aviation careers. And AOPA can give you a boost toward an aviation career. Our 2022 scholarship application window is now open. Therefore, primary flight training, instrument training or advanced certificates, or aviation maintenance certification. Now we're also offering over $110,000 primary flight training scholarships for high school students and teachers. It's all made possible through donations to the AOPA Foundation. Now take note of this date, you'll need to apply by February 11th. And the AOPA Air Safety Institute has a webinar coming up that's all about backcountry flying. I'll need to tune into that. It's called Back to the Backcountry. 2021 in review. Industry leaders will talk about how the backcountry flying season went this year, including lessons learned. Now it's all to prepare for an even better backcountry flying season next year. You can join the webinar November 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern and sign up at the link there on your screen. Well, today, Thursday, we celebrate Veterans Day. Our freedom to fly along with all the other freedoms we enjoy in this country just wouldn't be possible without the brave men and women who serve and have served in the military. And this week, a fly-in at Peach State Aerodrome in Georgia honored veterans. Throughout the day, several warbirds and vintage aircraft flew into the grass strip. The event also raised awareness for the Ron Alexander Youth Aviation Program, where kids can restore vintage airplanes in exchange for flight time. And we have several veterans who work with us here at AOPA. We sat down and asked them to reflect on their time serving our nation. I was in the Air Force for 20 years and flew the entire 20 years, mostly flew fighters, F-15s and F-16s. But I did fly a little bit, uh, had a tour flying King Airs in the Philippines. I was an Army officer from 1989 to 1993 on active duty. And then I served an additional seven years in the individual ready reserve as part of my contract. I was in the Air Force for 28 years. I retired as a 06 colonel, and I was a special operations uh, navigator for most of that time. Attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, I graduated in 1972, and was in the Army for five years after that, from 1972 to 1977. I uh, served 10 years, three years in the Army, and seven years in the Air Force. Uh, consecutively. The, the very last tour right before I retired, I served as the commander and flight leader of the Air Force Thunderbirds and of course what a, what a capstone uh, tour that was. And you get to demonstrate the power, the pride, the precision of the United States Air Force 
and it was re it was really an honor, and uh, I I not only enjoyed it, but it had a deep sense of meaning to me as a as a as a mission. When I switched to the Air Force, I actually worked on SR 71s and U 2s. The first two years, I was an armor officer. I led a tank platoon in Desert Storm with the 24th Infantry Division. And then after that, I became a logistics officer and was a fuel supply platoon leader and the executive officer for the 226 Supply and Service Company. Pack up and go to Korea, it was, it was a hardship tour at the time. It was only, uh, it was supposed to be, I think, 12 months. It ended up, I got extended there. I was there for maybe 16 months, but being overseas without seeing your family, I think that was probably the most difficult part. No matter what unit I was in, we were a team, we always worked together, and it was just a real, uh, real strong brotherhood. People that you met, the people that you worked with, there were just super people there everywhere you went. Oh, the, the, best, the best thing I've ever done, I wouldn't uh, trade it uh, for, for anything felt like uh, you know part of a team but more than that felt like we were doing uh, we were doing good uh, for the world I'm so thankful that I served in the military it was it was service to my country but it was also honestly service to myself has just made me a better person all the way around a more disciplined person a person who understood uh, drive and and work and and teamwork and leadership and all those things I learned in the military, and I'm so thankful for that service. Integrity is uh, probably one of the primary things I, t I took out of my 10 years of active duty service. You know, learning to work together as part of a team, whether as a leader or as a follower, is very important. I just want to say to the other veterans, I'm proud to be one of you. And I also always like to say to the people that didn't serve in the military, thank you for supporting the military. It's because of you that the military in the United States is strong. And so for that, I'm, I'm very thankful to the people that didn't serve, but very supportive of us that really allowed us to do what we did. It's just a, a calling uh, that uh, brings people to, to serve the country in that manner. So thank you to every veteran out there. Uh, it's definitely appreciated. Veterans, if, you, uh, if you're feeling like uh, uh, you, you, no one cares if you're on this earth anymore, you're heading down that dark road, um, give me a call because you, know, you are wanted and needed. No matter where we serve, whether we're in the same area or uh, scattered around the world, um, you know, uh, you're, you're a brother to me and so I, I appreciate, uh, or sister, <laughs> I appreciate uh, your, your efforts as in the military and, uh, and out of the military and so I just want to say thank you. Mm. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks to uh, all our to veterans. Yeah, I, I, I never had the opportunity to serve, and it's something that I, you know, that I kind of regret. But we truly do honor everyone who has served. That's our show for this week. I can't think of a, a better way for us to end it. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe, comment, or send us an email. And we'll leave you with a bit of a leaf peeping flight over Western Maryland from last weekend. See you next week. Purchasing your own aircraft is an exciting experience. AOPA Finance simplifies the process, saving you money with lower interest rates and hassle-free loans, so you get into your new aircraft sooner. AOPA Finance, the right approach to buying an aircraft.